Hi everyone, this is Mike Lewandowski back again for another Bible study. Um, let's begin in prayer, and then I'll let you know what we're going to go through today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay. So welcome back. Let me silence my phone here. Um, so it looks just a few things. So it looks like we're probably, as of right now, probably going to have one video a week. I, I am releasing two Saints videos a week. But right now with Bible study, it the process, is ta it just takes a while. So after I record this and I upload it, that takes forever. Got to send it to the parish. They send me back a link. It's so it's it's just a lot of back and forth. So for right now, we're just going to do one a week. If there's going to be more, I'll let you know. So, um, so today we're going to cover Luke's gospel. We're going to cover um, chapter ten, verse thirty-eight, uh, where Jesus visits Martha and Mary, and we're going to go through the parable of the rich fool. So we'll end on twelve twenty-one. So that's what we'll cover today. And um, my main commentary for this is the Gospel of Luke by Father Pablo T. Gadens. Um, this is these are great uh, commentaries, Catholic commentary on sacred scripture. I've used these a lot before in other Bible studies, so they're excellent. Um, so that'll be my main source uh, for today. Um, and so I'm recording, just so you know, I'm recording this on Wednesday, April 20, today's April 22nd. Uh, it was about 10 o'clock at night. So I say that just in case, you know, if something happens tomorrow um, with, uh, you know, at the parish or something like that. And you're like, why didn't Mike bring it up or talk about it? So uh, this one I'm recording this. So I'm hoping it comes out in the next couple of days. Okay, so <clears throat> we left off last time um, in the Gospel of Luke talking about the Good Samaritan. And what's interesting is kind of the section in Luke we're in right now is there's not going to be so many miracles as there was um, in the section roughly from, what was it, like Luke chapter 4 to, into Luke chapter, into Luke, uh, what was it, chapter 9. So now it's going to be focused more on Jesus' teachings but also how he's traveling to Jerusalem. So he's going through various areas, um, encountering different people, not just Jews, but Samaritans, Gentiles. And um, however, Luke doesn't necessarily do everything in chronological order because he's going to jump um, ahead right now to Martha and Mary. And just, you know, they're from Bethany, which is only two miles from Jerusalem. Then we're going to go back. So he doesn't necessarily set everything up with how Jesus uh, chronologically would have would have uh, gone to those places before entering Jerusalem. So let's just begin, and then um, we'll jump right in. Oh, and thank you, by the way, just real fast, thank you so much for the emails that people have emailed me. They said they appreciate this. Um, I'm happy to do this, and um, like I said, doing the Bible study every week, and I'm uh, doing two saints small presentations a week. And just so you know with the saints, I'm not doing major saints because those presentations would obviously be very long. I'm trying to do a lot of the early church saints that I I necessarily I really couldn't do in Cloud of Witnesses because there's just not enough information for an hour long presentation. But I'm trying to do some of the early church saints um, just to kind of give people a flavor for uh, the early church um, and who were some of the key figures. So that's that. Okay, let's jump right into it. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, 
Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. Okay, uh, familiar gospel story, Martha and Mary. And of course, Martha is doing all the serving. And Mary is sitting there listening to Jesus um, you know, as he's teaching, as he's uh, basically instructing them uh, in the revelation of the Father. And of course, Martha gets upset and she's like, look, you know, I, I got to do all this serving. I got all this work to do. And, and Mary's just sitting there. Lord, yell at her. Have her help me out. Now, for one, I think on a very dishuman level, we can all relate to Martha. I know in my life, you know, there's been times where I'm like doing stuff. And, you know, you know, maybe we have people over or something. And, you know, the kids are running around and I'm, you know, my wife and I are cooking dinner and the kids are jumping on us. And, you know, I just want to say, like, to like, you know, you know, the people who are there, you know, can somebody just like play with one of the kids? Like, we have all these hot pots. We're trying to get stuff done. Please, like, uh, you know, help us, you know, help us, you know, to, to get dinner on the table. Um, and, you know, on a very human level, we get that. But what, what is Jesus trying to point out here in this gospel? Why does Luke include this in his gospel? Well, first off, I think it's important to understand is that it's very easy for all of us to get caught up in our to-do lists. Okay? Even prayer could become simply something we check off the list. Now, it's good to make, you know, to have prayer as a priority, of course. But sometimes we could just say, okay, you know, I just got to get this rosary out of the way. It's, it's on my to-do list. Okay, I said the rosary, you know, check it off. I'm done. Okay, it's easy for us to get caught up in all these distractions, all the little things that need to, to get done. And we could oftentimes postpone the most important thing. Okay, like confession time. So there's times where I'm like, you know, I really want to try to like meditate on the scriptures and I'm going to do that tonight. And, you know, many times I don't because, oh, well, you know, I got to get this done. Okay. Well, I want to kind of get this done. I'm going to do this. Okay. Well, now I'm really tired. So now I just want to like kind of, you know, chill out a little bit, watch a little TV. Okay. You know what? I'm really tired. So I wouldn't do, you know, I wouldn't be able to really get into it anyway. I'm going to do it tomorrow. So, we, you know, we put off the important stuff. And so what Jesus is saying is that Mary has chosen the best. She realizes what is the most important thing. What's the most important thing is not trying to get, you know, accomplish every little thing, but to spend that time with our Lord. Also, one of the ways the church has always looked at this gospel is that uh, Mary kind of represents contemplative life. Those are um, those religious who dedicate themselves to constant prayer who remove themselves from the world and spend their time day in and day out uh, praying with uh, many times very little, if, uh, you know, very little, if, if not any, contact with others. Uh, you know, one religious order that comes to my mind immediately is the Cartusians. Or, um, I don't know uh, in depth about every aspect of the Discalced Carmelites, but what I've read, it seems like that's their life as well. It, it's, it's contemplative life of prayer. And the church has really always valued that life. Now we may say, from a worldly standpoint, well, what are these people doing? They're not out serving the poor. They're not teaching. They're just praying all day. But as many will point out, the, the contemplatives in the church are really the ones who are keeping things going. They're the ones who are providing the fuel and are drawing down graces from heaven so that the church can go out and serve. And then, um, so Mary represents that, and then Martha represents kind of the more active religious, who's out there, you know, working at the soup kitchen, at the homeless shelter, um, who's, you know, bringing food to the poor, who's with the sick. So, two kinds of life, some are called to the more active life, some are called to the more 
contemplative life, but as a vocation, but what's important here is all Christians are called to incorporate uh, a little bit of Mary in our lives. So we do have to try to have that time where we just focus on Christ and our relationship with him. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge. But it's something we have to try and try uh, to do um, in our prayer life. In fact, just to, um, as you know, I was going to do a talk on Teresa of Avila. That probably will not happen to the fall. Hopefully it will happen in the fall. Who knows Who knows what's going on? But um, that was one of the things early on. She was really trying to get into that deep contemplative prayer, you know, going from vocal prayer and getting into that contemplation. And, and that, that's a journey that's hard. You know, many of us are very comfortable with vocal prayer, but to try to get into that interior life, it, it takes a lot of work and perseverance. So that's Martha and Mary. Now, we go on in, in Luke 11, and we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So that's Luke's version of the Our Father. Before we get into that, though, I love the question that his disciple asks. Lord, teach us how to pray. I think we all have that question. Because, like, I, I know myself, like, many times I'll be like, am I, am I doing this right? I mean, <laughs> am I really praying how God wants me to pray? And it's tough. It is tough sometimes because we we want to we want to make sure we're doing it right, and we want to make sure I should say you know we're praying as God wants us to pray. So we we want instruction, we want advice, and so this disciple goes up to Jesus and says, "Hey Lord, teach us how to pray." John taught his disciples how to pray. Now please help us, provide us with some guidance. So. Jesus then um, teaches them to address God as Father. So he's Father, hallowed be your name. Oh, just very quickly. Um, the form of the Our Father that we say at Mass comes from Matthew's Gospel and incorporates seven petitions, where Luke gives us five petitions. So obviously you probably noticed this is a little different from the Our Father that we're saying at Mass. But, I mean, you know, the church... Uh, through her history, kind of went more with Matthew's version of things. Okay, so, um, Jesus teaches his disciples to address God as Father. And this is an extremely intimate way to address God. So, how Jesus addresses God as his Father he wants his disciples to do the same. So he's calling them to this father-child relationship with God. Now, the Jews understood that God was the father of their people. But to address God in such an intimate way um, is really something of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. So that's what Christ is inviting them to do. Because through Jesus, we have this whole new level of intimacy with God. Okay, so Father, hallowed be thy name. Honoring his holiness, who he is. Your kingdom come, or the, you know, as we say, that kingdom come. And this petition expresses... Um, the desire of the disciple that God's kingdom will come in its power and its fullness. God's reign 
will be in full bloom, so to speak, the world. And Luke goes on to say, give us each day our daily bread. Okay, so on one level, of course, this is asking God to provide for our daily needs. Sure. But on another level, this petition um, asks God to provide the new manna. Remember, in the Old Testament, in the Exodus, before they reached the Promised Land, God fed his people on the bread from heaven. Every morning, except on the Sabbath, they would collect this uh, miraculous bread. And when they crossed the Jordan River, Joshua led them, the manna ceased. Well, there was this expectation that when the Messiah uh, would come, that his people would again have access to this miraculous bread. And this petition, as um, some express in the early church, is, is referring to the Eucharist. So the disciples asking God to provide us with this miraculous food. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone indebted to us. <laughs> well, so the first part is easy. Like, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I think we all agree with that. We all want to be forgiven. But I love the second part. You know, forgive us as we forgive those. Because, of course, all of us are, you know, forgiving everyone who wrongs us. We don't hold any grudges or have any bitterness towards everyone. And obviously I'm smiling because that's extremely difficult. So we're asking God for his mercy, but this petition also reminds us that we ourselves must be merciful. And that's difficult. That's extremely hard, especially if somebody really hurt us. It's hard to show that person mercy, but that's what we're called to do. And by the way, we're only able to do that through God's grace. So people will say things like, well, I can never forgive that person. Well, yeah, I mean, humanly speaking, you might not be able to. But through the grace of God, he will give us the strength and the ability to will what's best for that person. Not necessarily saying we're going to you know, become best friends again, but to will what's best for that person to help that person, to show that person mercy as well. So this is what God, this is what the petition is stating, that we we want God's mercy, but we are also called to be merciful towards others. And lastly, lead us not into temptation. And this is, of course, asking God to help us in our temptations. And it was also understood to... Um, for God to spare us from the tribulation that was expected to come um, with the coming of the Messiah. So it's, again, asking God for strength when we are tempted to go against his will or, in you know, um, at, the, at the time of Christ, to go against Jesus, to go against the Messiah himself. So asking God for that strength. So obviously the, the church, we pray this prayer at every Mass, we pray this prayer every day in the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, so this prayer is part of the daily life of the church, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus goes on. So after he explains the Our Father in Luke eleven five, and he talks about perseverance in prayer. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity... His persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay, so this one, after Jesus teaches them the Our Father, he teaches them a very important aspect of prayer, and that is perseverance. Okay, and he talks about, he, you know, he gives the example, you go over to a friend's house at midnight, you're asking for, you know, three loaves of bread. And he says, you know, the, the friend, you know, for his answer is, hey, I'm already in bed. Come on, we're all in bed here. Everything's shut up. Uh, you know, come back later. But he said his friend, the friend will get out of bed because of your persistence. Okay. And so Jesus wants us in our prayer life to be persistent. Now, of course, he knows our needs. Okay. But th think about it this way. We're supposed to be like little children in the eyes of God. Okay, if my kids want something, they, they, they get an A plus in persistence because they will keep at it. Knowing if they, let's be, I'll be honest, knowing if they keep going at me, bugging me, I mean, as long as it's nothing horrible, I, you know, there's a good chance I may eventually give in or say, okay, well, I'll let you have, you know, you know, one little piece of candy or, or something to that effect. Kids are persistent. They'll keep working on you. And since we're called to be like little children, God wants us to be that way with him. He wants us to have confidence and he wants us to keep asking. Now, the only thing I would say is, is persistence is a good thing, of course, because our Lord says it's a good thing, but also to keep in mind that whenever we are asking for something that we are always saying, but Lord, your will be done. And if what I'm asking for isn't your will, well, please show me, you know, what is your will in this particular situation? So we always want to keep, um, with, you know, have the understanding that it's, we have to do everything according to God's will. Just think of it this way. Like, you know, you'll hear people say, well, you know, I, I lost faith. I prayed and prayed and prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. He didn't heal my husband. He didn't, he didn't heal so-and-so. And, well, okay, but we have to understand is that, yes, we should ask. We should knock and the door will be open. But understanding that God always has a better way. And that part of prayer is helping to conform our will to his. It's not just kind of saying, well, you give me what I want or I'm not going to pray to you. Because that's, that's not the type of relationship we, could ha we should have with God. Just like with, with children. Now, if I don't give in to my children, they don't say, well, you know, I'm not talking to you anymore, Dad. They may be mad in the moment, but a few minutes later, they're fine and they're back again and everything's okay. So we have to have that understanding. We also have to, and, you know, not that it's necessarily being brought up here, but sometimes people will say, you know, um, you know, I, I, I read something where if I say, you know, this prayer this many times, you know, you'll get what you want. Okay. We don't want to get into, we don't want to ever become superstitious with prayer. It's not a magic formula. It's not if I say this prayer three times, you know, every day for God will answer. He has to, you know, he has to grant me my, my wish. Well, no, it doesn't work that way either. So sometimes even superstition can get into prayer. So we're persistent. We keep letting you know what we want, but with the understanding that, you know, his will be done. And by the way, of course, God's will is always what ultimately makes us happy and um, helps us on the right path. And he also says this, look, the father knows what to give us. I like how he says, you who are evil know what to give, you know, how to give your children good things. How much more does the heavenly father know what to give you? So, obviously, as, as, par as a parent, I want to give my kids the best things. But how much more does God want to give my children and me, my wife, great things? 
you know, I, I'm a sinner. I, I'm full of imperfection and I want to do good things. How much more does God the Father want to do who is perfection itself? So this perseverance in prayer. Okay? Keep asking God. Keep praying over and over. Yeah, and, and never, and again, you know, I know we always run into people and they're like, they could be cynical. They could be like, well, he knows God. He knows what I want. Sorry, the computer went to sleep. I don't know how that recorded. Um, so he, you know, some people will, in a very cynical way, say, well, he knows what what I want. So why should I ask him? Okay, but God wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. And just like with the people we feel comfortable with, we're close to, we constantly repeat ourselves. We bring things up constantly. We make our needs known. That's what God wants with us. Okay, so Luke eleven fourteen, Jesus and Beelzebul. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others to test him sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house falls upon house. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Okay. So... Jesus is performing an exorcism. He's casting out demons. And his enemies are accusing him of casting out demons in the name of demons. And Jesus says, that's absolutely ridiculous. Nobody does that. He says, look, that wouldn't make sense because a house divided, a kingdom divided, cannot stand. And in this passage, Jesus just, as he's going back at his enemies, he says that if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven has come. If I'm doing this in the name of God, if God is working through me, then the kingdom of heaven has come. But if you are against me, if you are working against me, who are you really in allegiance to? If God is working through me and you're against me, well, then you're against God. And you're doing the work of the devil. And so, again, Jesus says, whoever, whoever is not with me is against me. Okay, so he draws a line in the sand. We can't be on the fence when it comes to Jesus. We have to either be for him, and if we're not for him, then we're working against him. So the gospel requires a radical choice. It's not something where we could say, well, I like this. You know, it's, it's sometimes called cafeteria Catholicism. Like, I like this list of teachings, but this, these teachings over here, you know, they're not really my thing. It, it, we're either with Jesus or we're against Jesus. And being with Jesus means that we're obedient to all the commandments, that we try to seek his will in our life, and we realize that, you know, we're following him, it's going to make us extremely unpopular. You know, it, it's going to, people are not going to like us for what we believe, and especially in today's world, because so so much of our culture is just it's against Christianity. You know, we're very much living in a time like the early church. Okay, and then in Luke eleven twenty four to eleven twenty six, 
He said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he, find, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Okay. What's he talking about now? So, so if a spirit is cast out, um, he kind of gives, you know, the spirit's wandering around. And it'll try to go back into the person, excuse me, it'll try to go back to, um, into the person where it came, but this time it'll bring more spirits with him, more demons with him. Now, what he's saying is, he's emphasizing here is that, look, that his disciples must be filled with the Holy Spirit. They must be filled with God. It's not just casting out evil. But now we have to be filled with something. We And Luke, by the way, emphasizes the Holy Spirit um, throughout his gospel. And we, part of us being put back in order, is allowing the Spirit, allowing to God to work in us. So that when the devil does come back, and we are being tempted, we're able to, to keep him away. So it's not just about removing evil, but it's about filling ourselves with the life and the presence of God. Jesus goes on in eleven twenty seven, and he said this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that you sucked. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Okay. So true blessedness. Um, so Jesus um, is teaching and someone in the crowd uh, yells out, praising his mother. Okay. And Jesus responds by saying that basically those who are blessed are those who are obedient to the word of God. Okay. Now, Jesus here was not putting down his mother, but in a very real sense, he's showing um, in the gospel why his mother is blessed. It's not simply because she's his mother. See, one of the things the gospel is, is doing, and will highlight, actually the whole New Testament will highlight this, is that the true children of Abraham are those who have faith in Christ, those who are obedient to the word of God. So if you, you know, throughout the Gospels, many times Jews will say, well, we're the children of Abraham, we're, we're his descendants. And what Jesus is trying to emphasize is that in the New Covenant, it's not about blood relationships. It's not about family ties, earthly family ties, I should say. It is about those who are born again, who are... Um, become a new creation in Christ, those who follow the word of God. These are the true sons and daughters of the Father. These are the children of Abraham. These are those who are truly blessed. And so blessedness comes from hearing the word of God, receiving the word of God, and being obedient to the word of God. And who's a prime example of this in Luke's gospel? Well, Mary. Even Elizabeth acknowledged this in Mary back in Luke um, uh, 145. And she said, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So Elizabeth praises Mary that when she heard this news, unlike her husband Zechariah, I remember way in the beginning of Luke's gospel who kind of doubted everything, Mary believed this. She believed this would come to pass. She was obedient to the word of God. She said yes. And as a result, she gave birth to the son of God. And through her yes, she changed the course of world history. So what Jesus is emphasizing is, look, it's not so much those people I'm related to that are, are blessed. 
it's those who are truly blessed are those who are obedient to the word of God. And of course, his mother was the example par excellence of that. So he goes on, and in Luke eleven twenty nine 29, he says this, When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. But no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah uh, became uh, a sign to the men of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Okay, Jonah. Fascinating story. It's only four chapters, the book of Jonah. I was actually hoping of doing this book at the end of this year. But of course, who could have guessed that you know we would be in a pandemic and pretty much everything would be canceled. Um... But let's talk about this. So Jesus calls them an evil generation. And that harkens back to the Exodus, um, where it's this evil generation that comes out of Egypt, and of course, except for Caleb and Joshua, none of them can enter the promised land. Okay? So Jesus says to them that no sign will be provided except for the sign of Jonah. And Jesus said how Jonah went and he preached to the people of Nineveh. And these were Gentiles, by the way, the people of Nineveh. And then he references the the queen of the south and how the people of Nineveh and the queen of the south will condemn this generation. Now, Jesus first compares himself to the ministry of Jonah. In that... Jonah preached to the Gentiles, and what happened? They repented. Now, if you know Jonah, um, he wasn't too happy about them repenting. He was really hoping that God would, you know, pull a Sodom and Gomorrah on them. He, he, wanted, he wanted them judged for their sins, but that didn't happen. They repented. And, of course, what will happen is, at Pentecost... The gospel will go out beyond the confines of Judea. And yes, some Jews will embrace the gospel, but it will be the Gentiles, these pagans, who embrace the gospel. And so the church will quickly become full of Gentiles with very little Jews. Now, very early on, of course, it's predominantly Jewish, but very quickly that changes especially after St. Paul goes out to all these different cities in the Roman Empire. Okay, so that's primarily what Jesus is getting at in that passage, but also, um, and this is emphasized actually in Matthew's Gospel, as my one commentary points out, where there's also another connection, because Jesus spent um, three days, um, or Jonah, I should say, spent three days in the belly of the fish, And then he was um, spit out, to put it nicely. Um, He was, in a sense, resurrected out of the fish. And that, of course, connects with Christ, who rose again on the third day after being in the, you know, so to speak, belly of the earth. So there's always been that connection. The church has always seen that that connection, that Jonah is a a type of Christ. He foreshadows Christ. But... um, What Jesus was especially emphasizing here, though, was that the Gentiles, when Jonah preached, responded. And the Gentiles will respond. Um, And we're we're actually were responding as Jesus was preaching, because he does have Gentiles um, in the crowd. And of course, he praised the centurion um, early on for his faith. He said, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. Okay, then he gets to the queen of the south. And who's she? Well, it's the Queen of Sheba. And she was a Gentile. 
as well. This is during the time of Solomon. And she traveled. Um, you know, it slips my mind right now. I believe she was from Ethiopia, though. She traveled to see Solomon and to experience his great wisdom. And after meeting Solomon, she declared, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. So even though she's, again, she's a pagan, she's a Gentile, she comes after meeting Solomon, who Solomon also foreshadows Christ. She, she professes, she praises God. She praises his faith in God. And Christ says, you know, at the judgment, the queen of the south and the people of Nineveh are going to judge this wicked generation because Jesus' generation they don't have a prophet or a great king. They have God himself. And so if they're rejecting God in the flesh, I mean, there, there's nothing more he could do. I mean, you had these people. I mean, the, the people of Nineveh heard the word of God through Jonah, and they repented. It's actually even funny in their story when they repent, they put um, sackcloth and ashes on. They even put sackcloth and ashes on the animals. I mean, that's how serious the people of Nineveh were. So... That's what he's talking about, the sign of Jonah. And Jesus goes on and he says, No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under, under a bushel, but on a stand, that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is sound, your whole body is full of light. But when it is not sound, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with his rays gives you light. Okay, what's Jesus talking about? The light, uh, the, uh, the light of the body, it's like a lamp. What's he getting at there? Um, well, first, Jesus says something very simple. Like nobody in those days, especially lights a, a lamp and you know, puts it under a bushel basket. Or, you know, at your house, you don't plug in a lamp and then put it in a closet. You know, you, 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 you do this so that it will give light to the room. Now, earlier in Luke's Gospel, he made a connection that light is like the Word of God. And our eyes, now, are the lamps of our body. Okay? So... If a, he says, if a person eyes, and I'll, I'll explain all this, person's eyes are sound, their whole body will be full of light. However, if the eye is unsound, the person will be full of darkness. Okay, so what's he, he getting at here? Now, this is something that would have been understood. Obviously, it would have been a lot clearer back then to what he was getting at. So, there is an idiom in the Bible that a person with a good eye is generous, okay? A person with a bad eye does not help others, okay? So, what Jesus is saying is that, obviously, we receive the Word of God. The Word of God we don't, we, we don't receive the word of God and say, well, I can't talk, you know, about politics or religion. Uh, maybe we can keep politics out of it, but um, I have to hide my faith away. No, our faith must be visible. And how is our faith visible? Well, our faith is visible through our actions, through how we treat others. Okay? So... Our actions must manifest that we have received the word of God and that we are obedient to it. So, in a sense, um, our actions reveal, basically make incarnate, in a way, the word of God. That we have truly received it. So, he, when he gets into the eyes then, he says, we... Must our actions must be full of generosity. And this will show us, this will reveal that our, our soul is full of the light of God. 
But if we have a bad eye, then we are in darkness and we're not helping others. And this is kind of, a, I mean, honestly, it's a little bit of a confusing passage. But as you'll see, it segues perfectly into Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees and the lawyers of the law. So keep that in mind. A good eye is a generous person. A bad eye is uh, somebody who's not loving their neighbor. So we go in, and Jesus says this. While he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So we have another uh, episode where Jesus is dining with a Pharisee. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of extortion and wickedness. You fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give for alms those things which are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. So let's, let's just stop right there. Okay, so the Pharisee, and there's other Pharisees there as well. They're shocked that Jesus doesn't wash before dinner. Now, this has nothing to do with hygiene. It's not like they're sitting there saying, wow, I can't, this guy didn't wash his hands. Oh my goodness, he's about to eat. He didn't even wash his hands. It has nothing to do with hygiene. Okay. And there was a ritual washing that was established that they would go through before they ate the meal. And Jesus didn't do this. Now, this ritual washing before a meal was not found in the Mosaic Law. If you remember a long time ago, I showed when we had Bible study um, in room 22, um, I showed something on the Pharisees and it said one of the things they did, they took a lot of the temple practices that were done in the temple and that's under, for very specific reasons, obviously. And they kind of brought them into people's everyday life. But it's one thing when you're doing certain ritual washings before serving at the altar in the temple. That That's understood but Moses didn't you know God through Moses didn't um, establish these things to be done on a day-to-day -day basis you know you know especially before eating every meal so Jesus is not violating the Mosaic law okay so it's not like he's saying oh well that that was for the past I don't need to do that no he's not violating the Mosaic Mosaic law this is a tradition small t that has been added at a later date Okay, so Jesus obviously could, could read the room. He's sensing their disapproval, and he calls them fools. Um, and, and usually a fool back then is used a little differently than it might be used today. It really means somebody who's opposed to God. So you fool, you know, you're opposed to the will of God. And Jesus then emphasized that it is our actions that either defile us or make us clean. So do you have a good eye or do you have a bad eye? So cleansing dishes does not ensure that somebody has a pure soul. Jesus then emphasizes the need for them to give alms. And, because, and the reason he does this, obviously they're... They're lacking in charity and generosity because in many places in the scriptures, it talks about almsgiving covering a multitude of sins. And so Jesus in this, in this episode with the Pharisees is saying, look, okay, cleansing your dishes does not ensure that you have a pure heart that you truly love God. Going through these exterior actions does not do that. And I mean, we understand it too. Somebody could go to Mass and they could go through the motions. They could sit, stand, kneel, genuflect, do all those things. But that doesn't necessarily mean they have a pure soul. Um, they could be just going through the motions. So rituals aren't bad things, but one of the things with rituals is that we a person could just 
kind of just go through it without any sort of heartfelt love. Okay, Jesus is now going to address the Pharisees with three woes. So in verse 42, he says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and salutations in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like graves which are not seen, and men walk over them without knowing it. Okay, so he gives the three woes. And the woes, by the way, harken back to the Old Testament prophets. Um, they neglect the love of God and neighbor. So they're worried about just tithing for, for herbs, but they're neglecting uh, basically the whole law. What sums up the law is loving God and loving your neighbor. They love the best seats in the synagogue. They're all into honors. They love being addressed with all these titles, but again, they're lacking in love of God and love for their neighbor. And they're like wide open graves in that they're leading people to sin. They're actually leading people away from God through the way they live. Now Jesus is going to get into the three woes of the lawyers. And here's how he does that. So verse 45. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying this, you reproach us also. And he said, Whoa. I just got a funny. I, I just like how he, the lawyers respond. Like, hey, by saying this, you're actually attacking us as well. well. Yeah. Woe to you lawyers also. For you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you. For you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hinder those who were entering. Okay. So he talks to the lawyers. Um, so one, they're loading people with all sorts of burdens. And they're not helping them whatsoever. So they're requiring the people to do all these things, but are not lending them any assistance. And he says, you build the monuments to the prophets, whom your fathers killed, and in a certain sense, you... You're, 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 you're consenting to their actions. So they're fakes. You know, they're building these monuments. But again, there's no love of God there. There's no love of the truth. The prophets spoke the truth. And they take away the key of knowledge. This means they focus on trivial matters and not the kingdom. Okay, so there's focus on all these other things and not the kingdom of God. Now, just so you know, before he they leave, and, he, and as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard to provoke him to speak of many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So, again, this kind of proves Jesus' point. After the, you know, after Jesus says all this, why well, you know the dinner's kind of over. Um, so he walks away, and they're all, they're, they're trying to get him to talk more because they're trying to get him to, um, they're trying to get him to slip up so they can find something on him. So his words are having no effect on them whatsoever. Jesus goes on, he's going to warn against hypocrisy. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the multitude had gathered together, that they trod upon one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And so, 
Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, the hypocrisy. Um, and, and again, this is, again, a, an Exodus reference because um, uh, going back to around the time of the Passover, you had to remove the leaven from your midst, from your house. And you have to remove, which is saying the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Um, Okay, my computer just went dark for a second. I don't know if you heard me or what happened, but I just said you have to, Jesus emphasized you have to remove the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, Jesus then goes on and he says, in 12, 4, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, have no more, and after that, have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more, uh, you are of more value than many sparrows. So it's very quickly. Um, Jesus said, hey, look, don't worry about people who could, who could kill the body. Okay, so obviously he knows, he, he's letting them know, look, all this persecution is going to come. There's going to be a lot of martyrdom. But don't worry about those people. Worry about somebody who could lead you right into hell, to eternal punishment. That's who you need to worry about. And by the way, we've talked about this before, you know, people who, 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 who say, you know, oh, nobody goes to hell, you know, um, you know, while the, and again, while the church says we don't know who's there, except Satan and the, and the fallen angels, the gospel is very clear. I mean, Jesus is not, you know, he's like, worry about those who could lead you to hell. So obviously, he's warning them so that they don't go there. I mean, if, if, if nobody goes to hell, well, then Jesus is just kind of making up, you know, false threats, so to speak. He goes on in verse 8, and he says, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how or what you are to answer or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. So again, acknowledge Christ, and he will acknowledge you. Do not deny Christ. Okay. Um, The sin against the Holy Spirit, okay, this is something you'll hear a lot about, you know, depending on, you know, what you read, what you're watching. The unforgivable sin. It, it, essentially, the, the, the sin is this. It, it's not that we can't be forgiven for sin. It's not like, well, Jesus came to forgive all sins, but that sin. No, no, no. no. A sin against the Holy Spirit Um refers to those who do not really acknowledge their sins or repent of them. Okay, I mean, all our sins can be forgiven. It doesn't matter what we've done. But if we fail to acknowledge our sins, we fail to repent. Well, remember, God respects our free will. He, he, he's not, he doesn't force his mercy on us. So if we do that, sin against the Holy Spirit, sin against this mercy of God, there's nothing he can do. I mean, Christ could stand there and say, ask for mercy, I'll give you mercy. But if we say no, he will not force us against our will to be with him. So, again, all God wants to save all people, but part of that is acknowledging our sins and asking for his forgiveness. So, and the reason I just wanted to emphasize that is because sometimes you may hear things in, in non-Catholic circles like, you know, oh, if you say this, um, you know, if you do this or that, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. You can never be forgiven. No, 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 no. It's about not acknowledging, repenting of your sins. So lastly, we're going to end here the parable of the rich fool. We're, I think we're just about to an hour. Let me see my time. Yeah. This is going to take forever to upload. <laughs> now, um, one of the multitudes said to him, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? 
And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetedness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, which is, by the way, the first part, where Jesus is like, look, I'm not here to divide the, the family fortune, okay? There, 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 there's a lot deeper things we need to worry about. And here's where the parable comes in. The land of a rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards, towards God. Okay. So, Jesus, you know, so you have the situation, the guy's saying, you know, tell my brother to give me what's mine in the inheritance. And Jesus then goes into this parable. And he highlights a rich man who spent his whole life amassing wealth. He has all this, uh, you know, all his wealth at that time stored in his barns. And he's thinking, okay, now I could retire. Now I can live the good life and just rest. And of course, the parable takes a turn and says, you know, you fool. You know, you fool, you want to pose to God's will. Tonight, your soul's going to be demanded of you. Tonight, you will have to go before God and give an account of your life. And what will you say? And who then will be will have ownership of your possessions. So what Jesus is saying is you need to be rich in the things of God. You know, your life is not just about um you know getting enough money, getting enough security and then, you know, you know like 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 you know um and then you know retiring and now I could enjoy life. No, he's saying, look, your whole life, you better be rich in the things of God. Because when you are called, and you never know when, you will have to give an account of what you did. You know, and, and this, this to me really hits home during this pandemic. Um, I don't have the exact number of deaths right now in the U.S., but it's somewhere close to 50,000. It's, it's over 45,000. And so in less than... You know, or basically in the last two months, not even, you know, almost 50,000 people had to make an account of their life before God. And little did they, did they think that they would get called at that time. And so we never know when that day or that hour is coming. So we, we, just, we have to be prepared. We have to be rich in the things of God. Yes, there's nothing wrong with, you know, Obviously, planning for retirement or, or, or wanting some sort of uh, financial security, that's fine, of course. But that can't be our life, and that can't be what we build everything around. Because when we go before God, he's not going to say, wow, wow, you know, you're a financial wizard. Look, look, look at all, all you did. No, I mean, he's going to ask, did you love me, and did you love others? Were you faithful? Did you go to the sacraments? Did you, were you obedient to my word? Were you obedient to the church? Did you love God and put him, try to put him first each and every day? Those are the things we need to be rich in, not the things of the world. So let's end there. And um, one with a quick, quick prayer in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry, I said the glory be according to the Liturgy of the Hours. I've been praying the Liturgy of the Hours a lot, so it's a little different. Um, that's where I got it from. So, hey, I hope everyone enjoys this video. Um, send me any emails, any comments, and um, please stay safe. Take care. Bye.